G'day and welcome to a car that you're most likely not confident enough, or dare I say, men enough to buy, the Smart 4.2. See, the cars that we buy, they say so much about who we are, and some people out there, if they know it or not, feel the need to buy like a massive four-wheel drive or an overt performance car, and it's quite often to make up for a lack of self-esteem, or in terms of the men, sometimes a, a lack of real estate in the pants department. But the Smart 4.2 just says to the world, I'm incredibly confident and secure in who I am. However, even though the image that these portray might be positive, and when new were, were kind of groundbreaking little cars perfectly designed for built up in suburban and metropolitan areas, what are they like when they're not new? What goes wrong with them? What are they like to live with on a daily basis? What do they cost to own and operate? And should you even consider buying one at all? But first of all, what even is a Smart 4.2? So the Smart 4.2 has been available across three generations, but in this video, we're going to be focusing on the 2007 to 2014 second generation, which here in Australia was available as a three-door coupe or three-door convertible, both being rear-engined and rear-wheel drive, just like a Porsche 911. Only it's nothing like a Porsche 911. And here's a fun fact as well, the brand Smart was a collaboration between the Swiss watchmaking giant Swatch and automotive powerhouse Mercedes. As represented by the name Smart, S for Swatch, M for Mercedes, and Art because, well look at it. Now to explore the full deep dive of all the specific details on not only this car but a whole bunch of other used cars, just jump on Redriven.com and check out our incredibly handy and totally free Redriven cheat sheets. Now to do something that I've never done before, and I'll be honest I'm pretty excited to do, let's drive this. First up, in its natural environment, it's so much fun. Like, it's engaging and evolving all the time. It feels like a really big go-kart because, funnily enough, it's about the size of a really big go-kart. In saying that, it can get a little bit scary when larger vehicles drive past you, which is basically every other vehicle on the road, because it, you can feel a little bit vulnerable. As far as manoeuvring around built-up metro areas, which is exactly what this car was designed to do, it's still incredible. The steering is light, yet it does have a kind of decent amount of feedback to it, but manoeuvring into the tightest of spaces, an absolute breeze. Now, the ride quality is interesting. It has degraded after a few years, and because the wheelbase is so short, when you do hit a bump, like that, you kind of jump all over the place and it kind of like seesaws on its axis, but really quickly. So you do feel all, the, all of the bumps. These roads out here in this particular suburb aren't all that bad, but they feel like a rally special stage because it's yeah, every little bump you hit, like this one here, yeah, you get jiggled about a lot. Now, out on the road, it does really kind of get out of its depth. Like it gets buffeted around by crosswinds or even like a passing bus or a truck and that freeway speeds, it can be a little terrifying. But as I said, around town, like places like this, fantastic. Which then leads us to the Smart 4.2's performance because like when you put your foot down, it feels quick. It honestly, it feels exciting until you look down and you go, oh, I'm actually under the speed limit. So you will be overtaken by buses and really anything else. But again, it's the fun factor. Like even though it's not a fast car because it's so tiny and so tactile in the way it does things, it feels fast. Another thing that's brilliant for around town, the turning circle is tiny. So it's almost like no matter what the width of the street you're on, you can do a UE anytime. The other advantage to having a fantastic turning circle is it means that you don't have to do a three-point turn, which means you don't have to operate this stupid transmission from neutral into reverse and back into gear again. It's really slow. I don't know if it's getting slower with the age of the vehicle, but it's like a, it's like an automated manual. It's not technically, it's not a dual clutch. It's not like a technical, you know, torque converter automatic, but it's just, even when you're driving, even when you're accelerating, it changes gears and it's like, and there's a gear. And there's the gear. It has paddle shifters, but again, you like click on that, wait about 30 to 40 minutes, and then it changes gear for you. It's just, that's the only frustrating part about the mechanical layout of this thing. In saying that, but the actual engine note, it does, it does sound really good. It sounds like half a Porsche. One other negative, and it might be this specific example, but the brakes, are a little sketchy. They require, there's a lot of pedal travel. Also, the, the, the pedal's hinged from the bottom, so you've got to get used to that kind of feeling of braking like that rather than like braking like normal. And there's a lot of, as I said, a lot of pedal travel. And then when you finally get to actually braking, it's a bit squidgy. It might just be this one, but it's a little concerning. 
Look, overall, in terms of what it's like to drive, I bloody love this thing. I love the fact that it's not trying to be something it's not. It was clearly designed to be a nippy little around town car, and it does that perfectly. I've never driven anything that actually drives like this. It's just, I don't know, it's so unique and just cool. Well, look, first up, look, I'm a relatively tall bloke, and I assumed that I'd feel, you know, totally claustrophobic in this tiny little car, but you don't. It feels, I'm not going to say spacious. Obviously, it's a small car, but it doesn't feel cramped at all. Even sitting position-wise, like, it doesn't feel like you're sitting in a tiny little car, but at the same time, even though you do sit kind of upwards, it doesn't feel like an SUV either. Also, how cool is this? When you slide the seat forward, the seat goes up in height for, you know, vertically challenged people and when you slide back the seat kind of goes down for not vertically challenged people now in terms of design considering how like overt the exterior design is the design inside is almost a little bit conservative i know on the newer ones they've kind of added a whole bunch of color and it kind of feels really funky and fun in this yeah, it's it's humorous ish kind of but i do love the materials used like all this fabric everywhere feels good like it's you know a cheap budget little car, but it doesn't feel too cheap and nasty inside. Now, as far as wear and tear in this particular car goes, look, this is this owner's everyday driver. And look, the leather, it is getting a little bit harsh, but you know, that can be you know, brought back to life. The steering wheel is going a little bit glossy, but you know, the door cards feel quite good or the dashboard feels kind of nice. And even like everything feels, you know, relatively solid. Now, in terms of practicality up front, you've got a little storage cubby hole here. You've got two cup holders, which are rubberized, so the cups don't go flying all over the place. You've got a spot down here where you know, I think you put like, you know, a scarf or something down there. You've got some tiny little door bins. You've got two little cubby holes here either side of the steering column. Uh, you've got nets behind the seats. And also, because you can literally reach into the boot, you've almost got like ultimate practicality in the front due to the boot being just there. Now, practicality in the boot, oh, considering the size of the car, actually isn't too bad. Plus, you have more storage under here. Now, considering how tiny this thing is, it's actually loaded with a pretty decent amount of stuff. In terms of the exterior, Australian models come equipped with 15-inch alloy wheels, front fog lights, rain-sensing wipers, and remote central locking. While inside, you can expect an average-sounding two-speaker stereo with a CD player, a 12-volt power outlet, climate control, a leather steering wheel, paddle shifters, and a trip computer. But find a later post-facelift or special edition, and you might get a marginally better sounding four speaker sound system, black Napa leather upholstery, heated front seats, and a delightful fabric covered instrument panel. Now, obviously with the age of this car, you can forget about you know Apple CarPlay or Android Auto or any of that kind of phone connectivity, but you can fit that sort of stuff easily with aftermarket equipment, just like this owner has. Now, in terms of safety, many assume that because these are you know small enough to fit in the back of a Land Cruiser, they'd be absolute death traps, but they aren't. Sort of. Ah, uh, no, sort of, kinda. Firstly, the 4.2 features an ingenious tritium steel hemispherical safety cell, which is basically a fancy way of saying that the car's body is made up of a roll cage and crash structure. Actually, there are videos on YouTube of these things being smashed into a wall at 110 km an hour, and the body remains mostly intact, especially when compared to a conventional small car. But in addition to that, Aussie 4.2s come loaded with a bunch of safety equipment. But to take you through what safety equipment these things come fitted with, I'm going to do another voiceover, but this time I'm going to do it in my most pretentious art critic kind of way. The Smart 4.2 brings the occupant face to face with their own preconceived hierarchy of cultural values and assumptions of what is safe. Really, are any of us truly safe despite the four airbags, electronic brake force distribution, electronic stability and traction control? Each feature imaginatively propels its occupant forward into the seemingly infinite progression of possible scenarios that the, the 4.2's practice facilitates, while simultaneously pulling them backward via anti-lock brakes, brake assist and seat belts with pretensioners and load limiters. In a, in a quest for the, the original source of reference that underlines the smart's magnum opus. Now again, for the full breakdown of what safety and tech features these have, just jump on redriven.com and check out that cheat sheet. Landing in Australia in mid-2011, the Series 2 of the second generation 4.2 featured some minor cosmetic and equipment updates, but most notably, modifications to the ECU in the exhaust system to lower fuel consumption. In terms of variants... While other markets received a range of different trim levels, Australia had to make do with predominantly just the single-spec Pulse variant, while a smattering of option-packed special editions like the Domino, the Knight Orange, and Final Editions excited the range from time to time. 
Now, what goes wrong with these? Now, as always, before we get into this, a massive shout out to the owners groups that helped us with the research for this vehicle. Guys, if you've noticed that we've missed something major in this video, can you please let us know in the comments below so we can all learn from your experience and expertise? Now, in terms of the coupe models, we're finding that some of the paint on the roof is starting to fade and get a bit gross. And even models with a polycarbonate roof like this one, they're beginning to kind of crack and get a bit weird just like this one. In terms of the convertible models, there are some reports that the roofs are beginning to shrink and it leaves a bit of a gap at the front and that leads to water leaking in, and that's not good. There are reports that 2008 and 2009 models tend to overcharge their headlights and that just leads the headlights to blow out faster. There are some reports that the boot opening mechanism can just fail like it has done on this car. Now the majority of body panels on these are actually made from plastic and that plastic is really resilient but in saying that because they spend most of their time in built up metropolitan areas they can be really susceptible to accident damage so make sure you check for accident damage and dodge your repair work. Actually there's a whole bunch of other things that are critical to check as well and hence why we've made the ultimate used car buyer's guide the link for which is just up here and down there somewhere as well and guys please watch that before you buy any used car because it could save you thousands now inside the faulty temperature control modules can completely stuff up how cool the air conditioning thinks it's being and also there are some reports that the actual heater fan blower can fail as well also there are loads of reports of just various electronic gremlins happening all through the interior so if you are looking at buying one of these make sure you press every single button and make sure they work now before we get into mechanically what can go wrong with these things look guys the only way that we can keep making these videos for you is with your support and the easiest way of supporting us is simply by hitting the like subscribe and bell buttons and sharing our content as much as you can doing that would help us out so much okay now mechanically what goes wrong with these well look i'd love to tell you but i can't because i'm not a qualified mechanic but you know what jim is both the turbo and the normally aspirated petrol engines which are made by mitsubishi are fairly reliable and somewhat low maintenance although maintaining them can be a challenge because they don't have a traditional drain plug on the sump. You need to use a vacuum oil extraction device which isn't complicated but it makes it a bit harder to do oil changes for those of you who are playing with these at home. It's a similar story with the Mercedes diesel. Uh, they're fairly reliable although they do have a few problems with uh, the inlet clogging up and some EGR complications which is basically every modern day diesel really. There are plenty of versions of them out there that have got relatively high Ks, but they've all been really well serviced. The ones that have had timing chain complications or even worse still catastrophic engine failures, it's nearly always a result of lack of servicing, which is really hard to understand when you consider they're probably one of the cheapest cars on the road to actually service and maintain. Now, the transmission in these is by far the weakest link and the most commonly complained about part of the car. Even when they're working properly, people still complain about how they work. And when they're not working properly, people complain about harsh or slow shifting or not selecting gears at all or just no drive at all. Sometimes it can be a simple lube, adjust and a relearn procedure. Other times it can be the clutch actuator and sometimes it's the actual clutch. And in some cases over a period of a few months, all of the above. Although they are considered fairly reliable overall, the list of small annoying problems they can have can actually become quite long. If you really want one for whatever reason, tell us Adam, what can we expect to pay? Well, Jim, the pricing kicks off from around about seven and a half grand and tops out at about 16 grand, but the major problem you're gonna have is finding one. Smarts do have a really loyal following, but it seems like any time a good one shows up on the used car market, it just gets snapped up instantly. Now, what do they cost to own and operate? Smart claims a fuel consumption figure of anywhere from 4.4 to 4.9 liters per 100 kilometers, which according to the owners groups, is achievable, just. However, a Suzuki Alto, which is slightly larger, has more doors, is more practical, and should be a whole lot less money, claims a near identical fuel consumption figure. But after all of that, should you even buy one? Well, firstly, if you are genuinely considering buying one of these, congratulations, because it takes a very confident and secure human to allow one of these into your life, because they are very unique and quite polarizing. However, Unless you absolutely need such a short vehicle, or you're just a dedicated fan that loves what the Smart 4.2 represents, there are other cars that are worthy of consideration, like any of the plethora of tiny Japanese key cars that are landing on international shores, or more specifically, the Suzuki Alto and Daihatsu Charade. Actually, there are a whole bunch of other cars that can do what this thing can do better than this for the same money, 
But let's be honest, there's nothing else in the market like a 4.2. However, the difference between these being tiny and fun and huge and headache is an incredibly close call. So look, yeah, buy one, but just be really careful. So guys, do you buy one or do you just get a, a skateboard and put on some protective clothing and armor? Let us know in the comments. We'll see you next week. Actually, in saying that, there are... Uh, actually, there are... Oh, come on, Morris. And even for models fitted with a... Now, in terms of the coupe models, we're finding that models with the... Me, mate, what is going on? Okay, congratulations, because it takes a very confident and secure... <laughs>